You're welcome. Hello, Brian. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm good morning. Great, Haley. How are you? And I'm Stephen, good. thank you so much. Stephen's joining us from San Francisco, right? Indeed. Okay, yes. So it's a and little, and I early. apologize that at nine o'clock precisely, I have to run out of my house to a meeting with a client. So, all um, right. So we won't. We got a back. we got a good a good full hour, and then I will poof disappear like magic. <laughs> well, we I, I'll do. poof. I'll I'll poof too. Okay. <laughs> There'll be a lot of poofing at the end of the Poofing. Time. So, poofing. Uh, uh, Haley, Stephen and I uh, have known each other uh, since the early 70s. We, we met in Boston. Uh, and uh, and, we, and I, when I was the mayor's liaison, uh, Stephen was representing uh, the city's health and hospitals uh, on the mayor's task force on AIDS. Uh, and we kind of lost touch initially when he headed off to San Francisco, but this guy um, from Detroit beca became as a, a priest in the Zen Buddhist tradition, which I'm dying to know the story behind and find out, you know, did you ever imagine this when you were living in Boston? And also, um, He's extraordinarily uh, gifted as a, a teacher. He uh, has his doctorate and he's uh, in education, Stephen? Yes, educational psychology, yeah. Yeah, and he's a, he's a, a psychotherapist. Uh, he works on issues of, of trauma, of, uh, of addiction, and um, he's an amazing guy. Uh, I'm, so Stephen, welcome. Uh, to for joining Haley and me on this, I'm I'm going to let her start with questions because otherwise I'll just take over. Well, I think <laughs> I, obviously the first question for me is tell us about your journey into Zen Buddhism and did you become a monk or was it something that you um, studied and just yeah? Well, let's start with Good the question. Zen Buddhism. Good question. So Brian, I actually knew Brian before we met in Boston because I was a little uh, Catholic boy in Detroit um, when he wrote his uh, article that that led to his, uh, there was an integral part of his journey. And um, I can remember when I read it, because, um, you know, we read the Michigan Catholic to see if they would ever do anything humane um, for, for those of us who were different. Um, and I, my first thought when I, when I read it was, who is this guy? And why is he bringing all this hell down on himself? Um, and and then I moved to uh, to Boston and uh, immediately got very involved in um, primarily health justice issues for gay and lesbian folks and and um, and uh, never really for me looked back at the Catholic Church it had been an unwelcoming place and um, I was invited one year to go speak at a dignity conference the Catholic group it was their annual conference in Chicago and. Just at that time, the Pope had issued some encyclical that said gay is sinful and gay is bad. And each of the speakers of the steering committee that got up said, we will not let this drive us from the church. We will not let this. So they introduced their keynote speaker and that was me. And I said, well, what will drive you from the church? I mean, <laughs> these people have said that, you know, that you don't fit and that you're, that we're sinful and bad and broken. And, and it just made no sense to me. And, and. You know, also there was the whole history of, of um, uh, you know, the what the repression had done to the leaders of that faith in terms of uh, uh, sexual abuse and uh, rampant alcoholism, which I had gotten involved with um, helping some folks at that point. So I just knew that that I went for a period like many people did then without religion, um, and I said without spirituality. Um, and so I was. Uh, traveling around a bit, um, doing lots of activist work around health justice and, and having many wonderful opportunities. And I wandered by the Arlington Street Church in Boston one day, um, and Kim Crawford Harvey, the minister there, was giving this fiery sermon about, um, you know, how do we provide service to our communities? And, and um, you know, uh, and, and I just listened to it. And so I went in and uh, and started going there on a regular basis because it, it seemed like a good thing to do. And um, at one point early, soon after that, she said to me, you know, you are living proof 
that even if you go uh, 100 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, you can't outrun your difficulties. And so <laughs> I had a deeply spiritual response, which was to fuck yourself. Um, <laughs> and, but she said, go off on a retreat. And I said, I will, and I'll slow down and you know, blah, 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 I'll get a spiritual life. So I happened to go to New York that weekend for a for some activist work, not slowing down a bit. I think I probably left her office and went, went to New York. And on the bus, there was a brochure for a, a Zen retreat that was happening in upstate New York. Never had heard of Zen. It was sort of exotic to me at that time. Um, but it was being led by a guy who was uh, whose opening remarks in this little brochure talked about how in Buddhism, there was no judgment about who you loved or how you loved. Um, and that he was the assistant abbot of the, of the Daibazatso Zendo in New York. And he was a gay man living with HIV. Um, and I thought, hmm, now there's, there's a spiritual path that has some possibilities. Um, and so I went to that retreat um, and I arrived at the door and a woman with a bald head and a, and a long robe opened the door. And I thought, oh, this is, what, what have I done now? <laughs> and it was in upstate New York someplace. And she turns and points to this rack of similar dresses. And she said, put one of those on. You'll wear that for the weekend. Um, and come with me. And she walks me into this big room and it's all people sitting facing the wall, uh, sitting down on uh, Zafu's facing the wall. I thought, oh, no, 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 this, I have many things I need to explain and question. <laughs> she said, shh, just sit. And so for four days, that's what I did. Um, and because I have a connection to my uh, intuition or higher power or whatever you want to call it, um, of all the seats in the Zendo, the one I got was in front of the one big window that was there that overlooked, it was called Beaver, Beaver Lake, that was the name of this place. And it overlooked a lake with beavers, which I had never seen one before. So I spent the first two days um, watching beavers do what beavers do. Um, and then at some point, and about the third day of that, I felt something that I would later, I was not clean and sober at that point. Um, I was during the retreat, but not, not as a lifestyle. <clears throat> and um, and um, I felt something that I would later learn was grace or serenity um, and just a peace that I had never ever known and it turns out what that peace was was when we get quiet enough and we could hear our own intuition our own you know what the Buddha teaches is that we will return to our authentic self and um, and so that's what led me to Buddhism and then I studied for about um, 15 years and somebody said you know you started giving talks on Buddhism and and the, the, the combination of Buddhism recovery and mental health and Buddhism and LGBT um, and others um, uh, uh, rights and health justice. And maybe it's time for you to think about being a priest, a Buddhist priest. And I thought, no, no, no. I've had some Catholic experiences with priests and not interested. And, and of course, in Soto Zen, they don't wear the fabulous um, maroon and gold. They wear black like the priests of, of my um, early childhood. And so it was just like, no, no, no. And, and they shaved their head. And I was operating under the misnomer that I still had a full head of wonderful blonde hair as I had when I was 18. And so I thought none of that appeals to me at all. Um, and then um, one of the senior teachers took me aside and said, you know, in many faiths, the minister or priest or rabbi is, um, their job is to lead their troops to salvation. He said, in Zen Buddhism, our job is to be the gardener um, and to prepare the earth and then step back and let whatever grow grows. And I thought, I can do that. I could do that. So um, so I, I studied for a number of more years and was ordained and um, have been uh, teaching for uh, since uh, 2013, teaching that, that. And that's um, that the gift of, of Buddhist practice when you're a priest is that your your primary job is to teach. So, yeah. Yes. So, and I've had I've had no coffee today, and I just realized that answer was six minutes long. So I'll try and <laughs> no, Stephen. Sorry, <laughs> yes, you're, you, you and I are great bookends on this because I, I do the exact same thing. So, quick question: Why are you not in black with a shaved head? Um, because um, I, I I could I you know I considered for a moment doing that this morning that not the shaved head um, when you when. When you go through the ordination process, you have to shave your head. And then if you, um, there's a number of ways to practice. Um, and there's monastery practice, um, temple practice, which is the urban temples where people practice. Um, and then there's what I refer to um, and others as community-based um, practice, communities in. 
And that's where we continue to live in the worlds in which we live. And, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, who most people have heard of, a Buddhist teacher, a Vietnamese Buddhist teacher, he basically says that teaching is um, not done by just what you say. Um, teaching is uh, my life is my teaching. And, and so I don't, I do sit on, not at 70, I don't sit on Zafus anymore, but I sit, meditate every day. Um, it's really important to me to get back to that place of quiet so that I can hear what's going on inside and my connection to Haley and my connection to you and others. Um, um, but but my, my practice includes um, when I'm working with sponsees and AA, when I last night taught, uh, ended a 10 week course on psychological first aid um, for people who all during COVID have found themselves during quarantine, found themselves dealing with people in great distress and not knowing what to do. So this 10 week course gave people a small thing that they could do to intervene. Well, that's Buddhist practice, just as much as sitting in meditation or just as much as, as the rituals and studying the ancient sutras. So the, the practice, uh, you know, your life is your practice and, and, um, and, and my life is my practice. And so um, I don't need to go around in robes all the time. I've got some for ceremonies, but, but you know, robes, um, in many religions, people have finally figured out that it doesn't create a unity, it creates distancing, it's otherizing to people. So you're mm -hmm. the practitioner and I'm the priest. And, um, mm -hmm. and for me, the shaved head is, is the idea of that uh, was, was to, uh, you know, to, for, to live simply, um, to not be attached to fancy grooming and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I was willing to do it the two times that I've gone through. There's three stages of, of ordination and the two times that, that I've done it, um, I've been willing to do that. Um, at, but, it, you know, um, for me, walking around constantly being worried about looking like a cancer patient, far, far <laughs> away the spiritual benefit of not having hair. Um, and, and the best story about that is that they took a picture of me at the ordination and, and um, somebody sent me a copy of it. Um, by which time my hair had grown back, um, which is you know no longer the full head of blonde hair that I like to think it is. Um, and the two pictures side by side, you couldn't like from this angle, as you can see, it's like uh, you could just as easily be um, have a shaved head. <laughs> so it was just one of those ways of having another chance to think about what you know why did I think that hair was important and and you know what's the deal. So. I had a wonder, I used to live in New York and um, my entry into spiritualism was um, the Buddhist path too. And um, there's a wonderful stall in St. Mark's Square um, that is run by a Tibetan man who practices Buddhism too. And I obviously went in there and tried to like buy as many sort of trinkets and things. And eventually he was just like, enough, you've bought enough. Now it's important for you to actually do and be it. And yeah. it's those words, you know, very wise, but have always stuck with me where it's like, I don't really worry about what I look like. The more important thing is, am I actually being this? Am I walking the talk and living the life that A, I want, but also the life that can teach? Right. Well, I think, you know, a story just like that, my Buddhist teacher, my first uh, root teacher in Buddhism told me after about two years, he said, okay, here's the deal for the next year, you are not going to read any books on Buddhism or watch any videos on Buddhism. You're going to live Buddhism. And, you know, I was a graduate school faculty member and had been a graduate student for years. I said, wait, wait, I have to keep reading. And he said, he said, when you come to me, he said, I'm always asking you what you feel and you keep telling me what you think. And he said, Buddhism is lived in the connection between heart mm. and mind, between um, compassion and wisdom. And, and, you know, it's not found in the library. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so that was the first step in a really beautiful process for me of realizing that I was really attached to books and other people's readings and writings, and, uh, uh, partially because, you know, our lives are made up of stories. You know, from, from the time we were little children on, we were hopefully told that you were the best um, with the most potential. And in some cases, we were told you're broken and damaged, but whatever it was, they were stories. And we accumulate those stories like a library. And I think the gift of spiritual practice as we get a little older and, and hopefully we're, we're able to hand this to younger people with each, with each iteration. Um, but the, the, the deal is you get to go outside and close the door to the library and lock it and leave all those stories behind. And the only story that matters is how I show up today as my authentic true self um, with wisdom and compassion and how I share that in this hour with the two of you. 
and nothing else matters in this in this hour. And so all those old stories and um, the ver you know somebody told me I was broken and sinful and damaged, and then I made a huge elaborate um, Russian novel out of that and carried it around um, on my back for years until I finally said, you know what, that's not serving my relationship with Haley and Brian in this hour. If I'm busy thinking about, do I have anything to say? Will it be right? Will I humiliate all the, any of the three of us? <laughs> um, and, mm -hmm. and so if you let go of that and live in the present moment, which sounds, you know, like one of those slogans, but if you, if you do that, then we're fully present, the three of us. And, and uh, what a good example of spirituality that is. We talk a lot, Stephen, about the hero's journey. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for me, you're kind of a dramatic example of a person who, uh, if you, I'm sure you've picked up Haley Stephen is a very funny man. I mean, he, he, humor has been uh, uh, a means of communication for him for a long, long time. And, uh, and very political, really, you know, in Massachusetts, he was, he was on top of everything. I mean, if, you know, Stephen knew what was going on and if you didn't have Stephen's support, then, you know, you were missing something. And to go from, you know, that heavy, political and um, uh, not wisecracking, but certainly you kept people on their, their toes with your humor. Uh, to be a, a Zen priest and to have found such peace for me is just a, a dramatic example of the power of, of uh, the message. Mm -hmm. You know, the messenger is the message, right? Yeah. You know, I think some of, you know, I still hope, hopefully I can um, amuse people gently these days um, from time to time. But, um, you know, I think some of that, Brian, I, re I remember back in one of your books, you telling the story of going to Ann Arbor and, and, um, and thinking, oh, here's, I'm finally going to fit in. And the mm -hmm. guys came in dressed in a wedding dress and, and, and you're thinking, oh my God, um, this is, these are not my people. I don't want this. <laughs> um, and I think those those wedding dresses are an example of how we all learned to survive back in those days. If we had to have humor, there was that tragic um, play and then movie Boys in the Band where a group of people eviscerate each other um, because in the confines of that tight apartment that, that they're in, I don't know, Haley, if you've ever seen either the play or the, uh, the movie, but it's this group of guys that get together and then they play this sort of truth or dare game and they're just horrible to each other. Um, but all done or mo uh, much of it done with sort of catty, wry humor. Um, and years after that, that the play had been, uh, the movie and the play, um, I saw that um, again. And I just look back on those days where um, we were so afraid reasonably that we could be fired, um, hurt, beaten up or killed, um, that we formed a community that had its own language and its own humor and its own um, you know, drag and other sorts of wonderful expressions. Um, and then we got in a circle and said, oh, nope, that drag, that's too effeminate. Um, that's too silly. You're not a serious person. We need to, you know, I, I raised the flag on health justice for our community. And if you weren't paying attention to that, then there was something wrong with you. And surely it was my business to tell you that. Um, and for the last 15 years or 20 years, I've tried to make um, my life's work, my spiritual practice about, about having the courage to connect. Um, and so, you know, when somebody, I was recently back in Southeastern Michigan to my nephew asked me to come and officiate at his wedding, which was really beautiful. Oh, um, nice. And many of the people there um, were um, non, non mask wearing, non vaccinated um, supporters of a candidate for president the last time around that, that sort of put a chill. Um, and, you know, I could have spent the weekend um, uh, rolling my eyes and, you know, thinking, uh, what's wrong with these people? Um, or I could use the opportunity to chat with them and find out how does somebody who would invite their um, their gay uncle, gay Buddhist uncle from San Francisco to officiate at your wedding, um, how does somebody like that support a political agenda um, that is not about health, that is not about justice, that is not about equality? Um, and and so I want to understand how that how that how that happens to somebody, how that what the thinking is and What's in your heart? Because these are, they were all decent, nice, wonderful people. Um, but, you know, we now 
um, that in this day and age that we, you know, the algorithm folks, I'm sure you talked about that on your podcast before, you will at some point, but, you know, um, um, Yuval Harari, um, if, you, if you've if you seen any of his work, he's, um, he's a, a, a philosopher, I think, from Israel who, who speaks a lot about for the last 20 years, the very richest people in the world paid the very smartest people in the world to create these algorithms to know what we what we are thinking so that the advertising and media messages can be aimed at us. And so and it's worked. We know that, you know, um, and one of the th- wonderful things he says is, well, we keep signing up for Facebook and Instagram and these other things and we get these messages. Um, and, and then suddenly, if you look down the side of your screen, if I mentioned to Haley that I really um, like Docker Shoes, well, you know, by the, before we're finished with this podcast, there's an ad for Docker Shoes there. Um, and so what he says is the thing to keep in mind is that if you're not paying for the product, like if we're using Zoom for, you know, basically for free, um, it's because you are the product. Yeah. And in this current economy, these richest people in the world want to know what the rest of us think and how to influence our thoughts. Um, and so I think, you know, that that one of the challenges that we have right now is being able to really talk to each other, having that courage to connect. Um, and, you know, with folks that voted for other candidates, that folks that don't vote at all because it's not important, um, folks that won't wear masks even when they're, um, at, when they're around um, people who are vulnerable, the elderly or people with compromised immune systems. And so it's like, I don't assume, as I might have at one point, that those folks are um, backwards or not well-informed or stupid or evil. Um, what I assume now is that they are believing um, the messages that exist in their world. And to the degree that we refuse to have the courage to connect and to share with them our worldview, um, there will never be any movement. You know, people get really entrenched and, and locked down. So I think an important part of spiritual practice for all of us at this point is that, that having that courage, that compassion to really connect with other people um, who with whom we don't agree and, and don't understand. Because if we don't understand, we can't, we can't, uh, We can't actually educate or move with compassion. Right. And I do feel that there is more of a push towards this more um, humane, innate connection. Um, And I think, obviously, I see it because I'm in a specific circle. And obviously, you see things that you're looking for. And I've found that in my circle, and it seems to be spreading wider and wider, that fewer and fewer people are now on Facebook or Instagram. They're still maybe using WhatsApp, which is part of that conglomerate. But the number of calls that we're having in little groups, whether they be three or two, has exponentially increased. Like the actual one-on-one conversations, we not, may not be in person, but the effort, which doesn't even feel like effort anymore, it's a more of a, I want this person, I want to connect with this person. So I do feel like there is that shift going on. Um, but I'm also well aware too that anybody that is not wanting to see that in their world won't see it. Right. Well, I think part of the algorithm, um, and I don't know if you, all, if you probably have seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma, yeah. Um, uh, at, which is pretty disturbing to think about, you know, this this phenomenon of of how they're how we are all being um, fed these various um, these truths um, or agendas, I guess is a better word. Um, and I think that the antidote antidote to that is exactly what you just said, Haley, which is to spend more time talking to each other. Um, I was with somebody recently who um, deeply troubled by a diagnosis they had been given by a, a a medical provider who um, uh, does research and uh, and gets money for a drug company um, that he had prescribed drugs to this person. And then as he discovered four other people he knew who were seeing this physician all on the same drug, all told that they were deeply um, uh, emotionally and mentally disturbed. Um, and the fact of the matter was that, that at least in this person's case, it was not true. Um, and it was an easy fix. I'm not accusing the doctor of malpractice, um, but it was an easy fix rather than to say, who are you? Um, and what's happening for you right now? And what hurts? What is your um, story? Yeah, what, what, what's, you know, strip away all that other stuff and just, you know, just take so. So our first meeting together, um, um, we walked over to a park nearby here called Stern Grove and sat for 45 minutes and didn't talk at all. 
Um, and at the end of that, um, he was just um, moved to tears. And, and it was like, somebody's listening. Somebody's taking the time to listen. And the truth is, I don't have words right now for what I need to feel. I just need to feel connected. And so that courage to connect, I think, is, is uh, you know, and it's the basis of all spiritual traditions before they got mucked up by uh, people in leadership and, um, you know, the need to the need to be right and all that sort of stuff. But I think all spiritual traditions, as I've studied them, the, the bottom line is, um, you know, the Buddha famously said, um, Ananda, his one of his disciples said, Buddha, I think I figured it out. Um, having good spiritual friends, Kalyana Mita, having good spiritual friends is half the spiritual life. Buddha said, nope, Ananda, you haven't got it figured out. It is the entire spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So that capacity to love and be present for um, and, and to sit with um, that which is uncomfortable sometimes uh, is, such a, is such a true spiritual practice. I think it's a gift to... Mm -hmm. Haley, I'm, I'm not sure uh, I agree about the uh, uh, people leaving social media. Uh, like Facebook, I, I, uh, I, and I find Facebook for me uh, to be an important means of communication with people who are hungry for connection. I think it depends upon how you use it. And also, if you've got something today that you are wanting people to know about, social media is your only way of doing that. I mean, even, um, you know, I've, I've got a, Stephen, I've got a book that I'm, um, ready to publish called On Being Gay and Gray. And uh, our stories, our loves, our, our gifts, and the meaning of our lives. And <clears throat> even if I get a major house to um, pick it up, which I don't think will happen, but even if I do, they want to know, well, what social media are you on? Because you need to take responsibility to promote this, even with right. us publishing it. So you have to be on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram if, if you want the, the word out about this book that you've just written or the movie that you've just made, whatever. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not, I agree with you. I much prefer the one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, you know, yesterday I did a Twitter interview and there was people from Australia and Ireland and Poland. And you know, uh, it was an amazing, it was I had never experienced that instant um, international collection before. So I think what we've got to do is uh, figure out a way how to use best use the tools that were given and that others are using. You know, if I knew how to use TikTok, uh, you know, I, I could I could reach an audience that I'm not reaching now. Do you, Stephen, do you agree or disagree? With that do you, have a little, do you have a little dance planned for your TikTok debut? Oh, I could. <laughs> the Detroit Shuffle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been um, looking at a book by uh, Rabbi Rami Shapiro called uh, "Recovery: The Sacred Art," and in there he has this quote: "He says spirituality refers to behaviors designed to free you from the delusion that your life can be controlled and the illusion that you are controlling it." Uh, <laughs> and it just, to me, it really speaks to like I agree. I think. What Haley said is, I resonate with that. I think it's really important to have these conversations um, and to have them with just the three of us or the people that are listening or, you know, um, but to have those intimate conversations where you get a chance to sit in silence and to sit um, with what, what I and other folks refer to as a ministry of presence, just to show up and be fully present for somebody um, and to listen with your heart, uh, really, really important. And I think the world we live in, um, the people that are, are um, against health justice and against civil rights and against, uh, you know, at this point, and as you both probably know, there are 220 separate pieces of legislation sponsored by Republicans around the country um, to roll back gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and two-spirit people's rights. Um, 220 pieces of legislation, or, you know, and it, it is not done because they actually care about the specifics of that. It's done to create uh, an environment, a, a red meat sort of environment for their followers. And so it's all done um, so they can get that media message out that we care about uh, core Christian values and we care about family. And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a huge problem. But if we're not present on social media in response to some of that, in a hopefully a, 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 a quiet, careful, mm -hmm. well-reasoned, compassionate response to that, 
Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think there's lots of social media that we were well served to stay away from because you just get into a, you know, a mm -hmm. screaming match with, with um, folks who are, who are responding, you know, whenever they show one of those, uh, like a Trump rally, and they go out into the crowd and interview people, they, of course, look for the, you know, the most aggrieved, uh, you know, angry, um, enraged person. Um, and hopefully, if they have a costume with an elephant on their head or something, it's mm -hmm. all the better. <laughs> um, and we remember those of us that, you know, that did the original gay pride marches back in the 70s, they would show up and there would be, you know, the for the first march I went to in Boston was in 71. And, you know, there were about 150 people um, all dressed the way the three of us are dressed right now, um, except for a few folks that were dressed extravagantly. Um, mm -hmm. And when the newspaper reports showed up and the people on the news, those were the, you know, those six people were the ones in all the newscasts. Um, and, you know, one of them, as I recall, in that first march was was fairly loaded um, and was saying all sorts of uh, frothy things. And of course, that's the person that's that they up. interviewed. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think, if we roll that back and say, ah, these are all human beings that have been given messages, the same story I was given as a little boy that I was broken and sinful and, and, uh, and unsavable. Um, and I managed to figure out through time and support and love and, and my spiritual practice that those stories aren't true. Um, and then all of the ways that I created a life, um, including the sarcasm and humor that Brian referred to, um, to protect myself, to, to allow myself to get through this you know, hostile world, um, all of those were no longer necessary either. And I could slowly come out of that cocoon um, and see the, see the light um, and know that the light was other people. Um, and so if I could get rid of those stories, then maybe um, if we're compassionate and kind with other people, they can figure out that you can't say you support family values um, and then want to lock children up at the border of the southern border of this country or um, to deny um, trans uh, teenagers the right to mental and physical health care that they need, et cetera. Um, and if we can talk the same way we did the gay, gay rights, gay and lesbian rights movement, um, one person at a time, you know, the kind of work Brian did where it's like, I'm not some um, radical drag queen. Um, I, nothing wrong with radical drag queens, but I'm not one. I'm a little, cat, little kind Catholic, polite Catholic boy from the Midwest. Um, and, and I'm gay too. Um, and, you know, and now I'm gay and have had a husband for 115 years. <laughs> and we are stable. And, and this is exactly what you all said you didn't like about us is that we were running around um, doing too much partying and having too much sex. And as they met us one by one and, and we said, these are our lives. Um, and guess what? We're your sons and brothers and daughters. And, and, um, and that's, how, that's how the movement started. And then, of course, you know, HIV came. And then we, then we were vulnerable and dying and we were still your sons and brothers and sisters and cousins. Um, and so the natural, that innate capacity that people have for compassion was aroused. And so those two things um, came together. And I think that's, that's Haley, what you said about having small conversations with people and just saying, here's who I am. You know, I'm a clairvoyant, which I imagine in some circles, um, like in Southeastern Michigan, um, you would have been considered odder than me by some of those folks. Um, and just the opportunity to say, and all that means is I'm, I'm in touch with the possibility of being invited um, to be kind and being invited to be of service versus me thinking, as Rabbi Shapiro said, um, that I somehow am in control of, of, right. of what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to just kind of segue a little bit and ask you, being somebody that specializes in trauma, what, how big a part do you believe trauma plays in where we are as a society today, especially in the truth being clouded and having such polarization right now? Yeah, I think um, that, that's a wonderful question. And, I, and I, you know, I think that um, there was an association, and I can't remember the name of it, to, to blame them for this statement, but there was a point where they said, uh, one of the trauma medicine groups, and they said um, that they thought 95% of adult Americans had um, uh, diagnosable levels of trauma. And my response to that, when I've spoken with them and other people, is that, that that's extremely disrespectful to people that actually have trauma. Um, and that um, we need to have a trauma-informed and a trauma-sensitive um, culture. 
um, because people have been traumatized. Um, every, you know, we, we uh, for myself, thought as little gay kids, we were back in the 50s, to be a, 50, a gay kid in Detroit in the 50s was, um, you know, uh, was, was traumatizing. Um, and, and there are children who have been sexually abused and physically abused and emotionally abused. Um, and those are real experiences. And we have never paid good enough attention to helping them to rebuild their spiritual core. Um, and, and then there are folks that we now know have what we refer to as attachment disorders, which is that the folks that were supposed to love them didn't um, and made them invisible or made them wrong or just abandoned them. And that that trauma is equally responsible for the way people, you know, as I described my story, you developed a way to survive that. And sometimes it was um, by being isolated. Sometimes it was unfortunately suicide. Um, sometimes it was, um, uh, you know, developing an outer shell that was impenetrable. And so people are living with trauma. And, and we do need to do a lot of work saying to people, we hear you, you know, we hear you. But, you know, I think sometimes we get so into um, resiliency that, you know, that that's the buzzword, like if you've had trauma, so we're going to help you to be resilient. Well, you know, that's, that's sort of almost reeks of a little bit of privilege, right? That, that, you know, this, this idea that we can do a three-day workshop with some magic incantations and you will, you will find your own inner resilience. Well, the fact is we all have our core spiritual peace is there and whatever we can do to help people get to that. And I think that over the last, um, 20 years, there's been a real effort for people never to be uncomfortable. So unsafe or traumatized is, is a huge thing and we need to respond. And then there's uncomfortable. We don't, you know, we don't want people to be uncomfortable. And so we don't have certain conversations and we don't ask certain questions and we don't make ourselves available to create certain movement because you know, the idea of, for instance, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a huge um, uh, uh, movement and has helped a lot of people, I'm sure, um, and is, you know, kind of like a, a pyramid. Everywhere you go, there's mindfulness-based stress reduction. Well, as the two of you know, if you actually do mindful awareness and if you actually take a deep look inside, it is very likely not going to be stress reducing <laughs> in the beginning, right? When you take a look at you know, for me, I was 45 or 50 years old when I got I got sober and then started taking a look at, wow, how much of this of these stories in, in my library can I uh, donate somewhere, lock the door and leave them all behind and get to the true self? And it was like, wow, that is not stress reducing. That is suddenly it's like, oh, here I am in the world faced with just me um, and my capacity or blossoming capacity to be real and to be honest and to be vulnerable. Um and, and so it was, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge thing. And I think being uncomfortable is part of life. And, and, you know, I think we should not be trying to make sure nobody's ever uncomfortable. Um, and so that idea that 95 or 97% of people have had trauma, um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I think we need to say to people, things happen in life and you get a chance to deal with them by speaking to friends, by right. connecting, by asking for help, by being very, very quiet, go sit by a, a stream and just get quiet and your intuition will speak to you, your higher power, your spiritual practice, your, you know, um, the other methods that, that folks have of really truly hearing um, and that everything is not a trauma. Some things just, you know, something I didn't get what I wanted, somebody else did, um, you know, I can practice empathetic joy for them or I can be pissed off and bitter, um, but that's, it doesn't have to be a trauma. It just has to be, oh, there's me um, um, being a little bit jealous again, or, you know, Mm -hmm. So, I, so I think I think the trauma work is important, and it needs to edu inform the way we educate, the way we raise children, the way we speak with each other. Um, but I think it's a uh, I think we're doing a misdeed if we talk too much about you know everybody has had diagnosable level trauma because then um, it frankly in some cases gives us an excuse for being non communicative or being shut down because right. I've had so much I've had so much trauma in my life. Right. Uh, if, if I can go back a little bit, um, Stephen, when you talked about uh, the role that I played in being, you know, here I am an Irish Catholic kid from Detroit. I'm not a drag queen. Uh, that, that was a lonely, really lonely journey, because mm -hmm. in our community, that wasn't celebrated. You know, uh, I tell the story about the fag rag people putting my picture on trees in the Boston Common 
after I was made the mayor's liaison saying that I invited people to a public orgy, you know, co-sponsored by dignity and integrity. And um, it, it's, you know, they I didn't get my invitation. Yeah, they were mean, you know, they were mean. And I know that it came out of hurt, but the position that you're espousing at, and Haley and I all agree with is of today that our calling is to be reasonable. You know, I there are so many days that I want to put a post up because uh, Ray reads out loud the news, you know, these damn Republicans, can you believe? Blah, blah, blah. And so I I want to, to put a post up uh, and I'm, you know, I can be funny and I can be um, sharp uh, and I want to put a, a red meat post up because I want to express that. Uh, and even if I type it, I delete it because I know that I'm basically just stirring the pot and I'm not doing any good. Well, that position really can cause loneliness too because people feel, come on, your head's in the sand. You know, why aren't you yelling with the rest of us? Do you not care? You know, uh, so uh, the calling I think that we all have is not a calling that is uh, an easy one sometimes. Um, it yeah. can be really lonely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, a question is, am I willing to have a different life, right? So am I willing, you know, I, all those survival skills I developed, the sarcasm, the being humorous, the throwing red meat back at the red meat eaters and, and all that stuff. And, and my spiritual practice that, that I have used is asks a simple question, which is what else is possible? And that's I, all my clients and sponsors, I always say, just ask that question so that if if somebody hangs your picture on a tree, it's like, you know, there's an expression in recovery, hurt people, hurt people. Um, and so it's like, you know, on, on their way to printing that up and, and uh, hanging that on a tree, how closed down do they have to be not to realize that there's a human being whose face you're sna stapling to a tree and, and saying things designed at the very least to get him fired from his job. Mm -hmm. um, a job that we, including those folks at FAGREG, had spent a lot of time saying we need to have a representation in government. And so now we finally got it and he's, you know, not quite meeting their standards. Uh, and so for me, I just always say like, when I'm talking to somebody and they say something rude or dismissive or, you know, um, I, I, I always try to say, what else is possible? You know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and, you know, the tendency is, uh, you know, there's a certain finger that wants to pop up and honk the horn and it will feel better for a second. Um, mm -hmm. And then you realize um, that, you know, they may be on the way to the hospital or they may be have just got fired from their job or they, you know, may have just spilled their hot coffee into their lap. Who knows? What else is possible? What would cause a human being to behave that way? And I don't have to have an answer to that. I just have to have the question. What if, you know, that's not an aggressive driver, that's a human being um, who's going somewhere. And the more often I ask that question and step back um, in the in the in the grace of not having to have an answer to it, just like hmm, okay. So if you say certain things to me, I know immediately that you're a conservative, um, meat eating Republican from Alabama. Um, and in fact, you know, it's somebody who lives a block down the street here in San Francisco um, mm -hmm. who's ha having a bad day, um, or yeah. who just came just came from a weekend of of workshop on expressing themselves, and so now that's what they're doing. Who knows? Yeah. So I don't yeah. have to have the answer. I just have to say what else is possible. And, and, and what happens when I honk that horn, who else am I impacting? Because the horn is heard by more than just the person who cut me off, it's heard by everyone around me. And how does that horn now impact the rest of their day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a story I heard some, I think it was um, Sylvia Bornstein tell one time is that the idea that you get somebody yells at you and the grocery store treats you rudely and you tell them off and then that person goes home and they tell off their partner. And then the partner, it's time to take the dog out. So it opens the door and kicks the dog out. And the dog goes out and bites the kid next door because the dog is mad. And so you can go back to the store the next day and say, oh, I really apologized yesterday. I was not having a good day. And I, and I told you, you know, I said something rude to you. Um, but it's those ripples. And so I think one of the gifts of mindfulness, of mindful awareness, um, at, at whatever spiritual journey you might be on, is is that capacity to stop. You know, Viktor Frankl said between um, stimulus and response, there's pause. And in that pause is the opportunity to create change. And man, if we could teach everybody one thing from a spiritual standpoint, it's like, do the pause, do the pause, stop before you, before you respond. You know, they, sometimes they have intentionally um, stimulated you um, mm -hmm. and they're wanting a response. 
And if you just take a deep breath, and for me, that is um, um, what else is possible, you know? Um, and it can be whatever words people want it to be, or just a deep breath, you know, just a couple of moments of deep breath. But it's like, if we don't respond, um, you know, we have um, draft folders on our computers. Wouldn't it be great if we had a draft folder? You know, as you said, Brian, you could write, you could write that and then delete it. Um, and I'm not just savvy enough on the computer because I'm afraid I'd hit the wrong button. <laughs> send it to everyone. Okay. But, but, you know, if we had that, if we had that capacity in our lives to say, hmm, I, here's, well, here's how I want to respond to what Haley just said. And I put that in the draft folder um, and not send it for 24 hours or one hour or some period of time that works for a person um, and then respond to it. And, you know, it's like, wow, that, that most of those emails would never get sent. They get erased. And we probably feel just a little sad that, that at some point in my last 24 hours, I wrote such a thing. Um, mm -hmm. But at least in the pause, we would not have had added chaos and anger to the world. We would have just added quiet. And what a gift that would be. Mm -hmm. I feel so often that I'm in a position of speaking about the importance of I am and the importance of I and self. And I always get response, no, it's we, it's us. We're a collective. And, you know, if we took a moment to understand the I and how important the me was in the collective, and to your point, if each person was taking a moment and to, you know, what is the impact I make and to slow down and have that breath just to be like, is this, do I have the context? Do I have all the truths? I think we would be in a different world or we would okay. definitely be seeing a, a, a quicker and more expansive change. Yeah. Well, you know, I, th I, I do think that sometimes you know, that collective consciousness that, that we sort of fall back to, it's, it's, I agree with you, Haley, that, that it's in Buddhism, we talk about no, no self, um, and the actual teaching is no separate self, that, you know, it's not, it's not that there's no me, I'm obviously right here, um, and you're there, and you're there, um, so, so, but um, no separate self means that, that we exist right now in this hour, and whoever listens to this, um, you know, we exist in this moment with each other, but it's the three of us with each other, and if we look at that, like Buddhist history and, and collectivist cultures versus um, the late stage capitalism in which we live, um, if you look at collectivist cultures, it's we come together. If, if Haley needs some breakfast, I bring some breakfast. If Ryan needs to go for a walk, I, we go for a walk. Um, so it's not, uh, it's just, I'm not just living about me, but it's I am invited or called um, to be of service. That's, it's part of my, part of my life. Um, and and um, that spiritual call or spiritual direction that I get um, informs when, you know, if somebody says, you know, if we were sitting in a room together and Haley said, well, I got over here as quick as I could for the meeting, but I didn't have time for breakfast. Very simple. You get up and, and get a little something and, and share it. And, and that kind of understanding comes from me. The same as if I thought, too bad, you should have set your alarm earlier. That comes from me. And so we can't sort of wipe away, um, you know, it's like, well, we're all in this together and we have to do this, right. this three person conversation. So I don't have time to step out and be humane. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's, it, there's not a difference between I and we, because we like, you know, we is a collection of individuals who can choose to live collectively. Um, but you choose that, or you listen to the calling that you're getting. Um, the invitation that the universe is giving you to be a, a more compassionate, more wise human being. Um, and if you follow that, then that's me coming into the collective way, um, but not shirking the responsibility for showing up, you know, because we can all ignore, we can all ignore that invitation. And sometimes we're too busy or the sun is out and I want to walk to the ocean. And so Haley will just have to get her breakfast somewhere else. You know, um, we can all ignore it or we can choose, um, you know, to live in that invitation and to live in that possibility of being kind and compassionate. Uh, Stephen, to what extent is gratitude uh, an important part of your life? Uh, somebody uh, drove all the way over this morning uh, to bring me uh, a, a magazine from the Center for Spiritual Living and show me a particular passage on gratitude. And um, I, I, gratitude is a really important part of raising my um, 115 years to go, <laughs> 45 actually, uh, 
but we do talk about it all the time is that, you know, it, a grateful heart wants for nothing. Is that also part of your practice? And well, I think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the vulnerability to say, um, you know, I, you know, is that, that uh, quote that I said from, from uh, Rabbi Shapiro, it's like things are going to happen. Um, and I can either resist them or be grateful for them is the sort of uh, uh, thing that we've um, uh, taught ourselves over time. Like some things I'm going to reject and resist and, and, and other things I'm going to embrace and accept and be grateful for. Um, and the fact is um, that we need those other experiences to teach us how to be um, live in the moment when things are going well. And so uh, there is no um, lotus without the mud, right? There is no light without the dark. And in the teaching of the Buddha, it's like, don't mistake that there's, um, that, you know, the teaching of non-duality, those things always exist. And so gratitude to me um, is mixed with a great um, uh, mix of acceptance. It's like, here's, here's what the world has to give today. Um, and do I wish that we were all sitting together in a room um, sharing um, bagels and cream cheese and tea and coffee and, you know, whatever, whatever it is we all eat. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Um, but instead, I get to meet Haley and, and see a dear old friend. And, and so we got Zoom, and that's what we got. And so mm -hmm. I can be grateful. I can be grateful for this opportunity to share, share our, our spiritual journeys with each other. Um, and, and the minute I forget that, um, there's a wonderful liner note from an album. Um, and, and it says, it's not that I'm out of mountains to climb. It's just that sometimes you have to stop to consider the one that, are, that, that you've already got your feet on. So it's not that I'm out of mountains to climb. So there's always going to be struggle. There's always going to be opportunities to work harder or to correct mistakes and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, um, there's a certain amount of privilege in a statement like that. But then you get to be grateful for all of it. Grateful for the struggles, grateful for the learning opportunities, grateful for the hurt, because mm. when you get hurt, um, you know, um, and and I know that when uh, three people like us talk about that, other people are saying, well, you know, if you were poor or a person of color or trans, um, mm. you wouldn't be, you know, hyping all that. Uh, and, mm. and I can't speak to that because I am none of those things. Um, but I work with a lot of people in those communities and those families. Um, and it seems to be the same is true that if you have acceptance about the realities of life and are grateful for the ways that you can connect and, and it's in those connections that we move through the struggles, right? Um, as you and Ray have done, I'm sure over the years. Um, and it's in those that we have the wow moments, you know? Um, I think Annie Lamott said that there are three kinds of prayer. Um, yes, thank you, and wow. Um, mm. and, and, you know, that's, that, that's pretty much it. You know, if we, if we can say yes, because reality, you know, it's, it's not a good idea to get in a fight with reality. Reality always wins. So if we can say yes to reality, and then figure out how through our connections and our, and our, and our own pausing, um, we can be strong enough to face reality, um, then we, I think we really have to be grateful. And, and I think for all of us, it's a day-to-day it's a -day lifelong process of remembering that gratitude is an option, right? Gratitude is an option. And, and uh, the more we take it, um, um, the, the more we're able to face the hard times and the good times with equal resolve, you know? Yeah, and I think the gratitude of practice for me is really important. And lately, it's been also unconditional love. And I think that comes with these reminders. Are you, you know, walking the talk? Are you contributing and being aware and mindful of your impact? And it's a, you know, when I have those moments where I'm starting to feel myself sort of wander off and become anxious about, oh, this happened, or, you know, I didn't really want it to work out that way. It's either gratitude or unconditional love or both that I'm working mm -hmm. on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've been practicing with people with recently is, is and I, I can't give credit to whoever thought it up. It was not me. Um, but there's this practice that's called I'm all right right now. And the practice is that five times a day, you take a deep breath or two or three and you say, I'm all right right now. And the idea of that, much like people writing gratitude lists, is the, here's all the things I'm grateful for today. Um, but we live in a world that's sort of tilted towards everything's a crisis and everything's a trauma and so forth. Right. And so if five times a day you stop and say, just those four words, I'm all right right now, 
and you begin to develop uh, a memory bank in your in your in your life of even when you know somebody who you care about deeply is sick and um, even when you know the job you wanted you lost or didn't get or you know uh, I recently went through some little heart stuff and it's like even when that's happening it's like you know you could be sitting in the hospital um, drinking your nice cup of ginger ale and it's like you know what in this particular moment I'm all right right now and it's just about you know and the, and the suggestion is to do it like five times a day and you develop this bank of you know by and large no matter what's going on in the moment I'm all right um, and if I'm all right in this moment, then my immediate spiritual response to that is to want to want to be present in the ministry of presence, to be present for somebody else who might not be having their all right moment right now. We have time for one more question. We've got five minutes left. So, Brian, right. do you have a question? Just a, a, a quickie, Stephen. Do you, uh, you have a support community for yourself. You were talking earlier about, you know, 100 percent of the message is you know being surrounded by people with whom you share, do you have that for yourself? Yeah, I, I, you know, as a person in recovery, I have um, regular uh, fellowship of people that, that we uh, get together to talk about our journeys. Um, as a Buddhist priest, we have uh, sanghas and study groups. Um, we have a group in San Francisco that we've had now for 25 years called Meditation and Recovery. And twice a week, a group gets together and does meditation and shares um, conversations about what's happening in our lives and so forth. Um, really intentional groups. Um, and then um, the gift for me um, over the last 10 or 15 years is as I've gotten rid of understand what vulnerability is and gotten rid of fear-based living, um, I, you know, I walk around now, uh, back to our Midwestern roots, Brian, I walk around now and say hello to everyone. And a surprising number of people, especially during the last 15 months, have been desperate for someone to talk to. Um, and so... I think we are surrounded by the family of, of, uh, of human beings that, that we live with. And uh, to the degree that, I, I, I love the expression ministry of presence, to the degree that I'm just willing to show up um, vulnerable and maybe a little scared um, and maybe, um, you know, uh, whatever, but available. That available, uh, you know, that if somebody else might be having a lonely moment or a scared moment, um, just um, somebody saying hello can, can really, um, the, the, the risk of, you know, the, the courage to connect again. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Haley? I'm just basking in the glory of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, um, it's such a joy uh, to have you. It's, I, I don't know why we wait for these, you know, Zoom interviews to talk to each other. Uh, right. um, it's, a, it's really a blessing to me. It really is a blessing and... You know, yeah. we go through such, you know, as Stephen was saying, on this path and on this journey, this whole, like, there's no stress in becoming spiritual. Mm. It's a tough journey. And yet mm. we keep going. And I think it's moments like this where you find yourself speaking to extraordinary beings and you connect. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you have a heart That's connection and you then have that sort of, peace that passes with all understanding where it's just like we could all just be quiet and totally enjoy our time together <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah Thank so, you so when, much. when you visit when you visit san francisco we'll go to the ocean beach and we'll just sit and, and listen to mother ocean and we'll be we'll i would be love fine. to i actually have some wonderful friends in oakland um, and i spent a decent amount of time with them during covid right. um so it's lovely to know that you're right there right well wonderful and to see you both yeah. Um, Haley, Haley, nice to meet you, Brian. Nice to meet you. Back to all the way back to 74, whenever it was. Thank you for that yes. article. And, and uh, thank you for the lives we've all grown together this, and, this last hour. I'm so proud and happy for you, Stephen. I just admire you and you. am grateful. I'm so grateful. Yeah. And we have each other now. So yes, have a do. good day, everyone. Beautiful connection. Yeah. Thank bye. you. Thank have you. a great weekend. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.